know. I think we've all had a game or two that we thought looked kind of interesting when we saw it on a shelf in a GameStop, or we saw it on the digital storefront, but for one reason or another, we just never got around to actually playing it. And then when you actually sit down to give it a shot, you're just left to wonder what kept you from doing it before. I definitely had that experience with the game we're talking about today. Now, to be fair, there was a pretty good reason as to why I wasn't able to try out Gravity Rush when it first caught my attention. It was a launch title for the PS Vita. I mean, the box art alone first caught my eye when I was first introduced to the game. The character design, the otherworldly setting, and this whole concept of shifting the laws of gravity were something that I wanted to know more about, but I didn't have a Vita and I wasn't about to buy one just for one game and I wasn't won over by the rest of the system's library. Well, I've got a PS Vita now and I've finally been able to sit down and play the game, but it also feels like this game has sort of fallen into the realm of obscurity. It's a shame, but it's also kind of understandable given the strange history this game has. Gravity Rush, or Gravity Days as it's called in Japan, was created by Kerichiro Toyama. I'm really sorry, I probably absolutely destroyed that name, who is pretty famous for his work as a writer and director for Silent Hill and the Siren series. Well, the whole horror genre kind of stopped doing well after a while, so with this opportunity to step out from that label as the guy who works on scary games, Toyama decided to move forward with an idea that he had been toying around with for a while. This concept of people being able to float around freely through the air as he developed more ideas to flesh it out into a full game. The mechanics were functional, the engine was reliable, and everything was moving forward about as well as one could hope. But then Sony came along with this shiny new handheld system, the new younger brother to the PSP, and they wanted Toyama to shift this cool gravity action game to a new platform. The Vita wasn't as powerful as the PS3 though, and that meant changes needed to be made, including scrapping a lot of work that had already been done for the previous build. Add that with the sudden need to work in ways to show off the unique features of the new device, as well as some frame rate issues that were difficult to address, the future of this title was a little unclear, but it did make it to store shelves in 2012, and a few years later, Bluepoint, now famous for their work in the remakes of Shadow of the Colossus and Demon's Souls, put together a remastered version for the PS4, and oh boy, I sure hope you got your hands on a physical copy while they were readily available, because in North America, you could only purchase the physical version of Gravity Rush remastered through Amazon. Fast forward a few years, and these second-hand prices are what we're left with. Just stick that one next to Klonoa for games that deserved better. There was also a sequel for this game, but that's something we're gonna have to say for next time. As for today, I'm gonna be taking a look at Gravity Rush through the remastered version on my PS5. Partially because I think it's the more relevant version since the game is still available for about 30 bucks on the digital storefront for the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5, and people are more likely to have those systems these days than... this. Now this is a more heavily plot-driven game than the past couple that I've looked at, so I'm gonna be going back to something I haven't done in a while and split this review up into parts. I'm gonna leave a timestamp so you can skip the review of the game's plot if you don't want to be spoiled. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at Gravity Rush Remastered. The story of Gravity Rush is an interesting place to start, because while I actually do enjoy the overall narrative of this title, it's also where I have the most issues with the game. Now, there is a theory that this could be tied to the game's troubled development cycle, being crafted for one system and then shifting over to a handheld and having to scrap a good amount of the work, and maybe that theory holds some water, but one thing at a time here. Just know that there is going to be a lot to unpack here, because my main issue with the story of Gravity Rush is that it does introduce a lot of interesting things, it's just not as good at doing much with it. The game centers around a girl named Kat and her strange mystical feline, Dusty. After waking up in a park with no memories and no clues to her origin, our lead character isn't given a lot of time to get her bearings before a desperate man approaches her, begging her to save his son who's being sucked away into some kind of black hole swirling around in the sky, and it's here that she discovers that Dusty has the power to grant her control over her own flow of gravity. After saving the child, but, um, failing to save their house, the man and his boy immediately turn sour on Kat, essentially blaming her for the destruction of their home like, I'm sorry, maybe I should just grab this little brat by his ear and drag him right back up to that hell void, how about that? It's here that we're shown that not only are people like Cat with her abilities something that these people know about, referring to them as shifters, but they're also looked down upon as troublemakers for some reason or another. With posters lying around for another shifter named Raven, Cat sets out to track her down and find some answers. Now the player can mess around with the gravity mechanics in a more open environment, chasing down this crow that will lead you to the other shifter. Now I actually think that this is a really important little objective to have this early 
play in the game, and the reason is because it creates a hook. With Kat's memories gone, there's a lot to figure out about this town in the sky and about our main character herself. The gravity shifting ability is an intriguing mystery in and of itself, and finding another shifter could mean receiving some answers to the questions the player has twirling around in their head. But presenting the player with this initiative and then plopping control in their hands is a great way to convey the level of agency they hold over progressing the story and discovering more about the characters and nature of the world that they find themselves in. The reason this is significant is that it takes something simple like a gameplay tutorial on how to use the gravity shifting to move around in an open environment and turns it into something that rewards the player's desire to interact with the mechanics as well as allowing them to pursue the answers to their curiosity. Answers are not so easily achieved in this plot though, as you'll discover the more you proceed through the game. Cat is not able to make any meaningful contact with Raven, so she's out on her own for the time being. The rest of the game centers around her establishing herself in Hexaville, the city suspended high in the air on a large column known as the World Pillar. She finds a friend and a local officer named Sid, creates a home in an empty pipe in the underbelly of the city, aiding local civilians with odd jobs and helping reactivating portions of the town, and discovering that these gravity storms, the rifts hanging over Hexaville, have been tearing away parts of the city and separating the people from their loved ones who are now trapped in some other part of the world. All the while being terrorized by not only these otherworldly creatures popping out of the rifts called the Nevi, but some master thief named Elias who's been stealing powerful artifacts from around Hexaville for some unknown scheme. Kinda feels like they were building him up to be the main antagonist, but nah, you encounter him twice, he seemingly dies after you fight, and he doesn't even show up again until some kind of weird dream sequence towards the end where they reveal who he really is without revealing who he really is. I mean, I totally think it's actually Sid, but in this game it doesn't really matter. I suppose the main plot could be summed up as Cat attempting to rid the town of the Nevi and returning the parts of the city back from the rifts with the help of the friend she makes along the way, all while improving her reputation among the people as they start to refer to her as the Gravity Queen. And the more people Cat meets, the more supernatural occurrences and unexplainable events start to occur. We have this fortune teller Aki and her omniscient puppet Pandora that help guide Cat to an old man named Gade who just kind of drops the fact that he's apparently the creator of this whole world like Okay then, usually when people tell you to meet their maker, it's not this easy. Well, Gay did create this world, his influence sort of stops there. His role as a creator is left somewhat vague, and yes, I did say a creator. Apparently there's a lot of people like him in other worlds. He does still have this ability to send Cat inside the rifts to reclaim the broken parts of the city by pulling a quick flash on her. Check it out, I've got a wormhole in my coat. Aye, aye! Reclaiming parts of the city introduces an obstacle though, as Raven is actually trying to stop you from doing so. Turns out she was promised by some local politician to Nelica that if she helped keep those parts of the city missing, he would help her send a rescue team to locate a group of children whose school bus once fell from the city. The kids have been trying to survive in a small village down there with a giant nevi they named Nushi constantly swinging by threatening to kill them and a destructive void below them is slowly rising to engulf them with their only means of escape being this thing called the Ark that could fly them up to safety if only they could find a way in inside the thing and get it working. When Kat descends the world pillar trying to find a love letter a woman lost from her dead boyfriend, she ends up stumbling across the village and discovers this was the reason that Raven was trying to stop her and that she was, in fact, one of the children that was trapped there. Time flows differently the further down the column you go, so after Raven somehow got her gravity powers and made it to Hexaville, she aged faster than the other kids. What's more, one of these other children trapped down in this village is a girl named Kiania, who occasionally gets possessed by another supernatural being who sends Kat on some kind of a bizarre trip of self-discovery, opening her eyes to parts of the world previously unseen, including the entrance to the Ark, and with the help of Raven, they're able to fly the kids back up to Hexaville, except no, they're not, because the new she shows back up and throws the whole thing off course. This is a lot of stuff, alright, I know this is a lot of stuff, and normally I wouldn't bother giving you the whole play-by-play -play like this, but I got a point to make here. This game tries to do a lot with its narrative in a very short amount of time, but frankly, I don't think it does a very good job of taking those elements and actually making them feel like they lead somewhere. Cat wakes up after the Nushi attack, returns to Hexaville, but stuff has changed. Turns out a whole year has passed. The city is now under the rule of Danelica, who's turned this whole place into something of a military state, and Raven and the kids are nowhere to be seen. I do like the contrast here. Before there was always a certain sense of struggle that the citizens of Hexaville were dealing with, but now it's on a whole new level, with Danelica's new order putting a bit of a chokehold on the people. It's even affecting the way people act. Like, if you remember, you found the village at the bottom of the world pillar trying to find a lost love letter for this lady, and once you try to return it after the time skip, she doesn't even want it, acting so apathetic towards the death of this guy. Like, I get moving on, but that's just kind of 
cold. I just wish there was more time to develop Danelica himself. I mean, he and Kat don't interact with each other even once throughout this entire game, and while, yes, seeing people that she and the player care about dealing with the pressure of his rule is an incentive to want things to change, it's never pushed forward by any kind of firm goal. Like, there's never a specific plan to bringing this guy down from his position of power, and it's just sort of wrapped up at the end. We do see Kat interact with the military, who try to recruit her and essentially treat her like an outlaw when she refuses, but that's the extent of her engagement with one of the main antagonistic forces of the game. What's more is when we see characters like Kiania and Gade return, the game tries to toy with these concepts of existentialism, posing these ideas of one's perception of the world and how their reality can be controlled through that, where believing something to be true is the same thing as making it so. Questions are raised about the true nature of this world. I mean, it was created by Gade, but it's also established to exist as a dream, Kiania's dream to be exact, and the otherworldly being that keeps talking to Kat through the young girl is the dream guardian. Is Kiania dreaming all of this from another world? What happens when she wakes up? Why do I latch onto so many games about dream travelers? These questions are never answered. The game wraps up with the military creating a weapon called the Sea Anemone, secretly powered by a Nevi. Kat is pursued by an elite soldier, Yuncia. She was in the story earlier, but I'm trying not to be here all day, bear with me. And then she's captured by the military and frozen solid, like... I can't help but feel disturbed by this, it's it's just kind of haunting to look at. That's when her old pal Sid swings in, committing treason by freeing Dusty, who in turn frees Cat, who teams up with Yuncia to fight the anemone after it, of course, loses control to the Nevi inside it and starts decimating the city, but they need a little help. Looks like now is a good time to use this portal in my trousers to bring back the missing characters into the plot! Sup, ladies? Looks like you need a little help from the coolest character in the game. It's time to wrap this game up. And wrap it up they do. The three ladies take down the anemone and the game ends. Yeah, the credits start to roll as we see the plot threads continue to dangle in the wind. Danelica survived, but he's been arrested. He ponders the existence of Kat and her connection to some unknown force with no explanation. The Nevi are just not a thing anymore and stop showing up in Hexaville altogether with no explanation. Stuff seems to return to a new, calmer normal around the city as the Gravity Queen enjoys the time with her companions, but where did the gravity powers come from? Just who or what is Gade or Kiania or Kat? Where did all of these people come from? Where did the Nevi come from and why are they just gone now? What was the whole deal with Elias and what were his actual goals and is he even a bad guy? Are the Nevi inherently bad? There's a whole mission in this game where a Nevi takes over a girl because it's trying to physically and emotionally protect her and Wow, we just never want to explore that further? Look, I'm no stranger to ambiguity in storytelling, and in some places I welcome it. I don't think something like Majora's Mask would be as impactful if all the origins of the strange concepts like Majora or the Fierce Deity or those weird aliens were explained to you, but the game also knows that that information isn't important and doesn't bait you with it. With as much time as Gravity Rush spends focusing on the weirder elements of the game, it never actually explores them, and I don't think that any player would be out of line for expecting there to be more closure than what's on offer here. Like, Cool, you're bringing up all these existential ideas, and you're taking the time to make the characters and players ponder the true nature of reality, but those concepts are dropped almost as soon as they're brought up. This may be coming off as super negative, and I do want to stress that I really, really like this game, and I hope I can make you see why, but this is by far my biggest issue with the experience. I spent all that time running through the plot of the game to give you an idea of how much Gravity Rush tries to do conceptually, but doesn't really deliver on, and maybe a big part of this is because the story was maybe supposed to always be told in full. Maybe it was always meant to be a complete package, but having to switch gears so far into development led to the story being less complete than it was meant to. I mean, I had to throw out a previous version of this script that went on about the narrative for several more pages, but I decided to rewrite it in a way that broke things down a little bit more because I know you and I are not immortal beings and we don't have an infinite amount of time at our disposal. But if this game was always written in such a way where everything was left so obtuse and unexplained despite how much the game itself seems to insist that the answers to these burning questions matter, then I just consider that narratively irresponsible. This would be a much larger issue, but the moment-to-moment -moment interactions, the characters, the world itself, and especially Cat are the real heart here. They keep the player invested, and even if the overall plot stems off into way too many directions without a real sense of payoff, it is worth it if only just to be with Cat for that journey. She's a legitimately great character with a lot of personality and charm. She's no pushover. 
She's got some bite on her and she'll bounce back if anyone's driving her the wrong way, but anytime, without fail, that the immediate situation puts someone else in danger, she will drop everything to help them. She is infallibly good-hearted, infectiously optimistic, and even when things get dour, she's always got that upbeat attitude that helps her persevere by the end. Even despite all my other issues, I can't say I was ever actively angered by the failings of the plot because we had her at the center of it, and the way she bounces off the rest of the colorful and lively cast helps keep this game's head above water. I think that's a great testament to, if nothing else, the writing of the characters. Thankfully, this is the low point, and we've got a lot of good stuff left to discuss. The concept of flight has been a coveted ability mankind has tried to emulate ever since they were able to look up and wonder what it was like to soar through the air. We've seen countless technological attempts and successes at creating flight and enjoying its benefits, and of course video games have attempted to recreate the sensation of flight as well, and this has given us varying results, but never before have I seen a more creative and effective take on this idea than what Gravity Rush presents. It's not like the freeform nature of just aimlessly sailing off in any direction imaginable. Well, I mean, you can do that, but I think what helps this game's mechanics stick is all in the execution. As the name implies, the main gameplay mechanic you'll be messing around with in this title is shifting the flow of gravity as it pertains to Cat. You can press the right bumper to enter a stasis position, floating in a single place, and by moving the right stick to aim which direction to target, also using the gyro sensor on the controller for extra precision. From there, you hit the bumper again and off you go. You basically send yourself falling off into any direction you choose. So yes, to quote a Pixar movie, That wasn't flying! That was falling with style! There are a couple of set pieces the game uses early on to help serve as a tutorial for gravity shifting, but don't worry. I'll just use the first example as it doesn't go into much detail if you're trying to avoid plot spoilers. The first instance is right at the beginning of the game where you're trying to save this kid from a gravity storm. This is a good place to allow the player to get their bearings with the main form of movement in the game. There's a clear and urgent goal. Make it to the boy before he gets whisked away and the pieces of debris that float around you are offered as platforms you can use to travel forward. There aren't many times in this game where traversal is treated in a linear fashion, but it was wise to do so here, as the ability to move between locations by essentially shifting which direction you'll fall and stand in is strange and takes a little getting used to. Offering some specific tasks to tackle was probably the best solution to getting the player adjusted to the movement, especially considering how disorienting it can be at first. This is the first step in learning how much versatility the movement of the game gives to the player. The amount of freedom this offers you is great, but it also has such a great feeling to it. Actually, like I mentioned before, the game is known as Gravity Days over in Japan, and I think in some other regions as well, but personally, I just find the title Gravity Rush to be more accurate to the sensation the game elicits. I never felt dazed by the game, per se, but I absolutely feel a rush when falling through the sky at tremendous speeds. The game is going to set you in these very open environments. I mean, the whole thing is very open world in its nature. Of course, when you're floating around and you land on whatever surface you're aiming towards, you'll move around on that terrain as though it were the ground. Obviously, you can't just use these gravity powers forever. There's a gauge near the top of the screen that will tell you how much time you have left until gravity returns to normal. Now, you can grab these objects either in the air or along surfaces to instantly replenish your gravity gauge and keep going about your merry way, so keeping an eye on where these things are is always a good idea. And if you're worried about trying to maintain a sense of place in the midst of all this, the game does have an answer to this. An effect that I really like is that Cat's hair and scarf will fall towards the true ground no matter what surface you're on, so if you need a quick way to get your bearings among all the soaring around and twisting environments, the game will always show you where the level ground is. It can still be easy to disorient yourself though if you're moving around a lot in a short amount of time, and you can kind of lose track of where you are, and the way the city of Hexavel is laid out, even surfaces on the bottom of structures can look like the ground floor, which is nice when you're exploring to find all these precious gems lying around that you can use as currency to upgrade your abilities from your menu, like increasing the capacity of your gravity gauge, decreasing the time that it takes for the gauge to replenish itself, how fast you fall through the air, all that good stuff. You can also use these gems to activate several contraptions around the city, like drawbridges, elevators, light systems, stuff that helps get the place back in working order. When you activate these terminals in the overworld, not only does your reputation improve, increasing how much you can upgrade certain abilities, but you get access to challenge missions where you can put more of your moveset to the test, and it's a great way to become more familiar with your moveset, as you race to the finish using your basic shifting abilities, like a gravity slide, which keeps you attached to a surface but moving forward at a pretty fast pace, and if there's a perfect example to convince you to play the console version over the Vita, it's this. If trying to aim your gravity shift by tilting the Vita all over the place wasn't enough to convince you, the gravity slide is just shy of being completely unwieldy on the Vita, but feels just fine with a controller. And don't even get me started with how dodging in the Vita version is controlled by 
swiping the screen. Yeah, please play the remastered version if you can. Back to challenge missions though, some are simple races, while others shake things up by eliminating your use of gravity powers or having you use gravity to chuck items into a goal under a time limit or through combat encounters. Now this is where the mechanics of the game are really put to the test, and while the combat in Gravity Rush is certainly not perfect as it is in need of some tweaking, I'm actually rather impressed that it turned out as well as it did. For the most part, you have a single primary attack button, that being square, and pressing it will see Cat swinging kicks at Nevi with not much more than one basic combo, but to my surprise, this isn't all that Cat has at her disposal, and it's not what I use most of the time. The gravity kick is probably the most common attack Cat has, where you can float in the air around an enemy, line yourself up with their weak spot, and hit the attack button to send her rocketing towards her opponent with her heel. Attacks like these are also upgradable with precious gems, and the faster you level the gravity kick, the better. You do also have a special finisher move that will be prompted at the end of a boss encounter. It's the only time you'll really see it, and it plays a little cutscene to show Cat dealing a finishing blow, but I notice a weird little audio hiccup here. The leveling is just fine on the handheld version of the game, but for whatever reason, when you execute the finisher on the PS4 version, the sound just gets cranked up to 11 during this cutscene, and considering part of the scene is a battle cry from Cat ringing out of your speakers, it can be very jarring just how loud the game gets out of nowhere. Now, where combat starts to get a little shaky is with smaller and faster enemies, especially fighting a rival who is about your size. There's no traditional lock-on mechanic in the game, and honestly, I get why, considering you can't even move around in this game without adjusting the camera. So any lock-on in the heat of battle would prove to be incredibly cumbersome, as you would have to adjust yourself, face the enemy, lock-on, connect and attack, break the lock-on, get your bearings, and start all over again. There is a sort of soft auto-lock applied to enemies directly in your path, but obviously when smaller enemies are constantly zipping around the battlefield, or some enemies like these stupid swordfish looking things keep flying around and turning their face away from you before you can do anything to them, it gets really, really annoying. That really does make up the majority of the moveset, but you can also use the gravity slide and collide with an enemy to unleash a powerful kick right in their face, or even pick up objects around you and hurl them at the Nevi. There are several special abilities you can unlock in these areas called the Rift Play. These are made up of a drill-based kick, and then some sort of projectile attack, and some third ability that I can't remember because I never used it in this game. The rift planes are sections that you need to traverse in order to progress the story and unlock the next part of the city. These locations are generally straightforward, but it's where the level designers get to go a little crazy and play up the abstract visuals a bit. The real kicker is where one of these rift planes uses a kind of funny plot device to take away the effectiveness of your gravity shifting powers and has you thinking a bit more about how to utilize them to get through the area. There's a couple of places where the game will do this keeping gravity shifting as a mechanic in some instances, but taking away your control over it. I personally never had a huge issue with this. There's maybe one area in that rift plane I mentioned where an enemy was obnoxiously difficult to take out given the unexpected handicap, but otherwise I found these to be welcome ways to break up the gameplay a bit and test my mind a little. Breaking up the gameplay isn't something super crucial though, to be honest. While there's not a ton of variety to the main tasks the game lays out for you, the foundation of movement is so fun that any task applied to it essentially become enjoyable by proxy. I liken this to something like Spider-Man, where the combat and traversal are so well-tuned and so enjoyable that it makes up an already delicious cake topped with a variety of activities that help sweeten the deal. This is easily one of my golden rules now. One of your first goals when developing a game should be ensuring that the process of moving from point A to point B is enjoyable and you'll have a much easier time getting everything else to fall into place, even if all the player is doing is just running around the environment, but I also commend the extra content made for this game as well. There's three side mission scenarios created for the game which were initially DLC, but were integrated into the game proper when ported to the PS4. These will see Cat performing certain duties for people around Hexaville, offering well-thought-out missions that give you something fun to do with the game's mechanics and helps you grow a connection to characters in the city you really wouldn't interact with otherwise. This also nets you a few special costumes Cat can wear and it's just a neat little bonus. A cute little detail that they added to these side missions is that they have their own list of trophies and the images for each will come together to form a portrait of the outfit that you can unlock from that side campaign. The downside is that this does work perfectly fine on the Vita, but on the PS4 the images are a bit more separated and the effect doesn't really come together quite as nicely, and the way you view trophies on the PS5 just ruins this whole thing altogether. Thankfully, there are some other areas where the transition from handheld to console were much, much smoother. I really could never talk about this game without bringing up the stellar work that the team did on the presentation. The character design alone is fantastic. I love the fantasy future aesthetic here. It kind of reminds me of the earlier days of the steampunk look before it was sort of agreed on that it all had to look the same. I'm especially pleased with the amount of French influence the game has. You can hear it from the instruments and tones used in the music, and you can especially hear it in the words spoken by the characters. Everyone in Gravity Rush speaks in a fictional language created just for the game, but the moment that I heard someone talk, I knew 
exactly what language these words were derived from. I really like the choice to stick to a fictional language, too. It's something that I really enjoy from games set in a strange or fantasy-driven world. I think it helps lend to the world building a bit, but I also have to commend the delivery. Fictional language or not, the actors make it all sound very natural, like it's the words they've spoken their entire life, and I have to give them props for going the extra mile to make this sound right. Last dream must be. It's a cool place of fish you do one see. Plus you should do. Plans shall be man to dress up plans shall fit. To bless him a lowetry shall plan to the suffer. And oh boy, the music sounds just right too. The way the music paints the setting for the beginning of the adventure, to the upbeat tempo of a one-on-one -on -one duel, but I think my favorite track might be the main battle theme. It's got such a wonderful sense of whimsy and fun, and I was won over the very instant that I heard it. I honestly think that the unique score for the game is one of the things that makes Hexaville so memorable, but it certainly has some other great qualities as well. I'm sure you're familiar with Draw Distance. A game can only load in so much of what's in the background at a time before it starts affecting the performance. This is why games will often find ways to mask how far the game can load in assets, like the fog in Silent Hill, or the way Mario will decrease in polygon count the further he gets away from the camera in Super Mario 64. It's a way of making sure that there's not too much strain being put on the engine, but at times, like with that Silent Hill example, it can be used to actively enhance the atmosphere of the game. Gravity Rush is no exception, and this might be one of my favorite ways to handle draw distance I've ever seen, where structures will lose their textures and details, but retain an outline over their models while being filled with a faded color tone. This helps capture the style of Franco-Belgian comic style, referred to as Bond Dessinée, that helped inspire the visuals of the game. It's one of those things that I know must have been done in consideration of the Vita's limited capabilities, but it doesn't come off as a concession, it actually looks like it was a brilliant artistic choice, and I love it. In a similar fashion, the majority of cutscenes are presented in a motion comic style as well, complete with the layers of the images shifting depending on how you tilt the gyro sensor, and normally, I have a hard time getting into this style of presentation, but again, it doesn't feel lazy here. It feels consistent with the game's artistic direction, and I think it actually adds a bit more flair to the dialogue exchanges that may have otherwise come off as more dull. Plus, many of the crucial events with more action behind them are still portrayed through the use of 3D models, so it's clear that this choice wasn't made out of laziness. I think it adds much more to the game than it takes away, and I think that it's the best way to utilize the capabilities of the Vita, which is worth considering here since many of these choices were made with that system in mind. That said, I'm legitimately impressed by how far they were able to take this hardware. Like, not only do you have this open world, world city of Hexaville available to you, but these aren't exactly barren and empty streets either. The city has passages and stairwells weaving in and out of each other with layers of the city adding so much character to the location, balconies overlooking stretches of the landscape. I actually found it enjoyable to walk around and view the scenery on foot. This place is so well crafted. Even more than that, there's actually a lot of people wandering around the city too, like a surprising amount. They'll often react as cat plummets to the ground around them, cowering in fear from the sudden disturbance, but don't worry. It doesn't actually affect the plot or how the city views Cat overall. Actually, come to think of it, these poor people will fall over from just about anything. Hey there, how's it going? Oh, oh, I am so sorry. I am, oh man, Ed, please don't sue me. I live in a sewer. Funnily enough, when you take off during a gravity shift, you can actually lift certain objects off the ground and carry them with you. The people close by are actually included in this. Oh, the unholy amount of people that I've accidentally carried off, only to watch as they soar away to their doom beneath the clouds. Huh. <sighs> I am a hero. One area I will say maybe needed a little more time in the oven was the designs of the Nevi, though. I like the initial designs that are introduced, but as the game goes forward, they start to feel a little stale. Like, I really think these guys were meant to have a bit more texture to them or something, and I can almost feel the game trying to break free with more bizarre designs, but overall, I still find the Nevi to be very memorable, as I did with the game as a whole. I started off the video listing a lot of issues with the narrative, and yes, that is a bit of a sour note that I think keeps the game from being everything that it wanted to be, but I still have faith that the sequel might address some of that, and I can approach that criticism knowing that a lot of it was out of the hands of the creator. Everything else that this team put together, I mean, it's remarkable. It's been a while since I've been so taken by the charm and mystique of a game like this. I started playing out of curiosity and was amazed by how quickly I was taken in by the worlds, the tone, the mechanics, and even Kat herself. I can only wonder how 
different things could have been if more people had given this game a shot back in the day, and that question only becomes more sad now that Japan Studio, where this team was held, is seemingly disbanded. Sony has been reevaluating priorities, and I guess these days they don't value artistic pursuits of passion like this. They'd rather just go the easy route like a remake of <sighs> The Last of Us. I weep for the current state of the industry. Will we ever see a third Gravity Rush game? It's not looking very likely at this point. I mean, even if they tried, without the original visionaries behind the wheel, it might not even hit the shelves as something recognizable. Regardless of the future, I can't recommend this game enough. Despite any problems that I have with the storytelling, this is a real treat. A gem hiding in plain sight, and even if you can't get your hands on it physically, it's still there waiting on the digital storefront. I know the $30 price tag can be a little daunting, but please believe me, it's worth every penny to sit down and experience Gravity Rush. I came out of Gravity Rush feeling very fulfilled by a lot of it, especially the gameplay, but I do want to see more from this world and setting. Well, we do have one more game to look at, so I hope you'll join me next time as we take a look at Gravity Rush 2. Now, I might not be able to crank this one out in like two weeks like normal. I mean, Lord knows this video alone took me a lot longer to make than I thought it would, and I already know the sequel is significantly longer, but I am going to try not to make you guys wait for too long. Now before signing off, I want to give a very special shout out to my friends Matt and Lincia for helping doing some voiceover recording for the jokes in the plot section of the review. Thank you guys so much for that, and a very special thanks to my good friend and roommate Amanda. She's been doing some fantastic work with the thumbnails for the last couple of videos, including this one, and I know that she would really appreciate some support. I will leave links to all three of them in the description. Thank you guys so much, and I hope to send a couple of people your way. And until next time, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Discord, whichever you prefer, links in the description, and of course, as always, spread the word, tell your friends, and until we see each other again, thank you so much for watching. See you next mission. Hey there everyone, welcome to the end of the video. I know this took a little bit longer than usual to get out, it was like a, another week uh, plus a day. Really wanted to try to get it out that one day sooner, but it just... Man, I had so many things come up between, like, uh, the vaccine, like, knocked me out for a couple of days and wasn't really able to get anything done, and then work schedule's been a little weird. I did get promoted, so, you know, yay, store manager, that's cool. Uh, but, yeah, schedule, schedule's just been off, so it, it just kind of threw off, uh, the production of this a little bit. I'm not sure how long the Gravity Rush 2 review is gonna take. A lot of it's gonna depend on, um, how much I can sum up that game. I don't know if it's gonna be as in detail as this one was, especially when it comes to, like, plot. I, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I've never played the second game before. Uh, so we'll see. I'll, I'll keep you posted, and I'll try not to leave you waiting for, for so long if I can help it. But of course, as always, I get to do what I do because of viewers like you and my Patreon supporters. So once again, I would like to give a very special shout out to my top tier patrons. The current top tier patrons are Patricia Marcou, Christine Larkin, Earl Valco, Nicholas Morgan, Jacob Riley, Wonton Photo, and Surus the Skeptic. Thank you guys so, so much. I say it all the time. I really do mean it. Thank you. You guys make it possible and you make it worth it. With all of that said, I've got another video to work on. I'm going to try not to take too long. It's a, it's a whole thing. And uh, I hope to hear from you again soon. Or, or that you'll hear from me soon. You knew what I meant. With all of that said, thank you so much for watching. I have been Wayne. I hope the next video doesn't take too long to make. And one day, I'm going to figure out how to schedule all my stuff together. Alright, peace.